friends, I'm Miss Vesga, and for today's kindergarten ELD lesson, we're going to be learning more about exoplanet and creating our own exoplanet art. Our goal for today is, today we will learn about exoplanet colors and features. Come along with me as we learn more about exoplanets. Friends, if we want to look really far into space, we need a telescope. Telescopes help us see really far away into other solar systems. We can see all the planets with our solar system with this telescope. And if we look even farther, we can see exoplanets or planets that are outside of our solar system. Since our goal today is to describe exoplanets that we, um, that we will be creating together, Let's look at some of our solar system's planets to get some ideas for our exoplanets. When we look at planets that are in our solar system, we can see a lot of different colors. Neptune, what color is Neptune? If you said blue, that's correct. Maybe our exoplanets could be blue. What color do you see when you see Venus? I see brown, maybe some yellow. What color do you see when you see Mars? Mars is known as the red planet. What about Earth? This is where we live. What colors do you see? I see blue water, brown land, so there's some green land, there's some white clouds. There's lots of color on Earth. When we create our exoplanet art, we want to look at a bunch of different colors. Let's review some of the colors we saw. Red. Which planet was red? It's known as the red planet. <gasps> Mars. Mars was red. Brown. There were a few planets that looked brown. Mercury looked brown to me. Orange is the color that you can see on many planets. Maybe we could use orange on our exoplanet art. I saw yellow on Mercury and Venus. Did you? Earth was big and blue. So was Neptune. Green is a color that we can use on our exoplanet art. Purple is another color we can use on our exoplanet art. Now that we know the colors of planets, let's look at features. Features can describe planets. It can, planets can have swirls, it can have mountains, stripes, or even rings. Let's take a look at some of the feature words. Let's look at the word swirls. In planet Earth, I can see swirls of clouds. They're swirling around the whole globe. The next feature word is the word stripes. Do you see stripes on Jupiter? The next feature word are clouds. We can see clouds on Earth. Venus is also known for its clouds. Clouds can go on our exoplanet art. Another feature could be spots. There's one planet known for its big red spot. Do you know which planet that is? That's right, it's Jupiter. It has a big red spot right in there. We could use spots on our exoplanet. Some planets have rings. Saturn is known for its gigantic rings around the whole planet. Our exoplanets can have rings if we want them to. Some exoplanets have mountains. Mountains can be found on Mars as well. We can draw mountains like little lines like this. Lastly, some exoplanets can have waves. Waves look like this. On Earth, there are waves in the ocean. Now it's time to draw our exoplanets. You will need crayons, colored pencils or markers, and a piece of paper.
Now that we have our materials, let's go ahead and start with a circle, since most planets are round. Now it's your turn. The colors I chose today were red and brown. So I'm going to start with red, and then I'm going to look at the what features I would like to add. Let's see, I think I'm going to do mountains, and I think I'm going to do stripes. Let's do mountains and stripes. I want my mountains to be red. And I want my stripes to be brown. I'm gonna color in my stripes too. While I'm finishing mine, choose which features you'd like on yours. Would you like to do swirls, stripes, clouds, spots, rings, mountains, or waves? my new exoplanet. Now that we've drawn our exoplanet, let's use these sentence frames to describe what our exoplanet looks like. Let me start with another example that I came up with right here. This is my new exoplanet. I'm going to start with a sentence, my exoplanet is. Well, I'm thinking, which colors are my exoplanets? Hmm, I know that there's blue, and I know that there's purple. So I'm going to put them in the sentence. My exoplanet is blue and purple. Why don't you say that with me? My exoplanet is blue and purple. Nice job. The next sentence starts with, it has blank. Well, I'm gonna think about the features that we learned about. I know that my exoplanet has waves, just like this one. My exoplanet also has rings, just like this one. So I'm going to say the sentence, it has rings and waves. Say it with me. It has rings and waves. Now let's put it all together. My exoplanet is blue and purple. It has rings and waves. One more time, say it with me. My exoplanet is blue and purple. It has rings and waves. Nice job. Let's go back to our exoplanets that we created and write those sentences together. Now that I have my exoplanet finished, I'm going to practice saying the vocabulary in a sentence stems. The sentence starter is, my exoplanet is. My exoplanet is red and brown. One more time. My exoplanet is red and brown. The second part starts with, it has, oh, that reminds me, I have to use the features. 
What features did it have? It has stripes and mountains. Let's use it in a sentence then. It has stripes and mountains. Now let's put that all together. My exoplanet is red and brown. It has stripes and mountains. One more time, let's do that together. My exoplanet is red and brown. It has stripes and mountains. Tell me what yours has. Start with my exoplanet is. Very nice. And the second sentence starter is it has. Tell me about your features. Very nice. Let's go ahead and practice writing. At the bottom of your page, let's put our sentence starter. My exoplanet is. I'm going to put a line for now so that we can get our sentence starters on here. It has. I'm going to give you a second to finish copying what I wrote on my paper on your paper. Great. Now remember, my exoplanet is is describing the colors. What colors do I have? That's right, red and brown. So I'm going to look for the vocabulary word red and write the word red. Red. The next color is brown, so I'm going to look for brown. Brown. Oh, red and brown. The next sentence stem has, it has. What was that going to finish with? Oh right, the features. It has stripes and mountains. It has stripes It has stripes and mountains. Mountains. Now it's your turn. What colors does your exoplanet have? Go ahead and write that at the end of the sentence. What features does your planet exoplanet have? It has blank. Make sure you write your features in this line. Now let's go practice with another exoplanet that I have drawn. Friends, thank you so much for joining me while we were learning about exoplanets and their colors and their features. Did we meet our goal? Well, let's see. Today we will learn about exoplanet colors and features. We did that, great job, high five. We met our goal today. I can't wait to learn with you next time on Kindergarten ELD.
guys, I'm Ms. Vesga, and on today's Math Minute, we're going to learn about subtraction. Let's take some toys that I found to learn about subtraction. I had five toys. I let my brother borrow two toys. How many toys do I have left? Let's count. One, two, three. Five Take away two makes one, two, three. Nice job. Let's try that a different way. I had five toys. Then I lost four of my toys. How many toys do I have now? One. Let's see that in a different way. One two, three, four, five, take away four equals one. Great job. Let's try that with a different material. I have five crayons. I let my best friend borrow one crayon. How many crayons do I have left? One, two, three, four. Let's think of that in a different way. One, two, three, four, five crayons. Take away one makes one, two, three, four. Thank you for learning with me on our Math Minute. Hi friends, it's me, Miss Steckmeyer, and I teach first grade at Strive Prep Ruby Hill in Southwest Denver, and I'm so happy to be here on Rocky Mountain PBS with you today. Today our lesson is about constellation art, but before we get started, this is a reminder that this is an ELD lesson, which stands for English Language Development. So we will be practicing our science objectives along with some speaking or language objectives and some writing objectives too. This is geared towards kindergarten and first grade, uh, kind of the intermediate or advanced friends. However, we'd love for anyone and everyone to join us. Okay, last thing about ELD is that we will practice speaking in English, listening in English, writing in English, and reading in English. Okay, let's get started with today's language objective. It says, I can use sequence words to tell or listen to how to draw a constellation. There's a lot there. Sequence words. Hmm. Sequence words. Have you heard that word sequence before? Sequence means put things in order. What if I told you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And I said, put the peanut butter on the bread and get the jelly, put the jelly on the bread too, put them together, eat it. Are those clear directions? Were those directions easy to follow? No, I need to put them in order. I need to let people know what comes first, next, then, and last. So I might say, First, get two slices of bread. Next, get your peanut butter and spread peanut butter on one slice of bread. Then, get some jelly and spread jelly on the other slice of bread. Last, put the slices of bread together and eat it. That was much more clear and easy to follow because I used sequence words. So today we will use sequence words, not just in our language or our speaking, but also in our writing, because we have a writing goal. It says, 
I can use sequence words to write a story about my own constellation. Okay, so not only are we going to talk using sequence words, we're going to write using sequence words. And that's going to come at the very end of the lesson. I wonder if you noticed another really big word in today's objective or the theme of today's lesson. Do you see it? Constellation. Constellation. That's a big word, so let's clap it out. We're going to clap out the syllables where every time there's a vowel sound. Ready? Constellation. Count it. Constellation. How many syllables in that word? You got it. There's four syllables in the word constellation. Make sure you're saying every syllable when you say the word constellation. Constellation, my friends, you might already know some constellations. I wonder if you've ever looked up into the night sky and looked at the stars. Sometimes we call that stargazing. You ever notice that some stars are brighter than others? You ever try to make patterns or shapes of the stars in the sky? Kind of like connect the dots? Well, you're not alone. People have been doing that for thousands of years. They have been making pictures in the sky by connecting the dots between the stars. Those, my friends, are constellations. There are some ancient constellations from thousands of years ago, and there are some newer constellations that we use today. So, we went over our objectives. We talked a little bit about what sequence words are. And now, let's learn about some popular constellations and how people made stories about the constellations in the sky. Let's take a look at some popular constellations. I'm going to say the name of the constellation and then I want you to think, what picture do you see in these stars? There are no wrong answers. You can be creative and think of your own. This is Orion. Orion. What do you see in Orion? I'll tell you what people from long ago saw. They saw a warrior with a bow and arrow. Do you see the bow and arrow? These three stars are often very bright and they're known as Orion's belt. Orion's belt. Pretty cool. You might know this constellation. It's known as Ursa Minor. Ursa Minor. Ursa Minor actually means little bear. But you, you might also have heard it called the Little Dipper. Because it kind of looks like a spoon you might dip into water. The Little Dipper. Now, some people think that this looked like a little bear because they attached it to other stars in the sky. They were creative and they used storytelling to make up their own constellation. We still call it Ursa Minor. So if this is Ursa Minor, what do you think this one is? Ursa Major. This is Big Bear or the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is often one of the brightest constellations in the northern night sky. That's where we are on the planet. We're in the northern hemisphere. So you often might see the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is also important because it has helped people from all over the world be able to navigate where the North Star is. So it helps people know where they're going at night, especially sailors out on the ocean. This is Pegasus. Pegasus. 
Hmm. What do you see in the Pegasus constellation? You might see kind of a horse with wings. I think it's kind of hard to see. I think you have to kind of tilt your head maybe. A horse with wings, maybe you see it better than I do. That's the Pegasus constellation. Remember, constellations move in the sky. So sometimes they won't be straight on, just like Orion is tilted like this. Sometimes the Little Dipper or the Big Dipper, you might have to tilt your head to see it right. This is Draco. Draco. What picture do you see in the Draco constellation? Draco is a dragon. Do you see the dragon's tail and head? That's pretty cool. Like it's a big dragon tail and head. Awesome. So friends, people from long ago used the constellations to tell stories or even to tell the history of their people. When we make patterns in the sky and we're creative, it's natural to make patterns in our stories or be creative in our stories with each other. So I wonder, can you make a story out of any of these constellations? Hmm. Can you use sequence words to make a story with any of these constellations? I wonder what Orion's story is. A warrior in the sky. Or I wonder what Little Bear or Big Bear's story is. Or Pegasus, how did they get their wings? Or Draco, what kind of dragon are they? Are they a nice dragon or a mean dragon? I love constellations because they are a mixture of science and art and creativity. So I'm going to show you how you could practice creating a story about a constellation and then we're going to do it together. I'm going to choose Orion. I'm going to use the sequence words first, next, then, and last. Here we go. First, there was a very, very shy boy. His name was Orion. Next, Orion saw a giant, scary dragon. Then, Orion pulled his bow and arrow out of his belt. And last, Orion shot his bow and arrow <gasps> right into the dragon's heart. We did it! We came up with our own story about a constellation. So friends, that's what we're going to do next. I want you to be thinking about what sort of picture you could create by connecting the dots and then what sort of story you could make up about your own constellation. Remember, these are actual constellations, very popular ones, that you can look for in the night sky. When it's a clear night outside, it's so fun to look at the stars. Now, I don't know about you, but I get a little nervous when I have to read a story to the class, or I have to make up my own story, or I need to be brave, or I need to be creative. So, I have some calm down strategies. These are from my friend, Miss Lloyd. She's a great teacher at our school. Let's see. I think I wanna do five finger breathing. Do you know about five finger breathing? It helps me feel so calm when I start to get nervous. Let's practice it together. All you need to do is put your hand out, start at your thumb, 
have some marker on my hands. When you go up on a finger, you breathe in. And when you go down on a finger, you breathe out. Let's try it nice and slow. Nice work. There's another strategy that I want to show you on this card. It's called raw spaghetti, cooked spaghetti. You know what cooked spaghetti is, right? It's those noodles you eat with your pasta. Now raw spaghetti is stiff. It hasn't been boiled yet. So raw spaghetti means that we're gonna tighten our muscles. We're gonna tighten your fists, kind of like you're mad. That's raw spaghetti. But when I say cooked spaghetti, you're gonna let it go, ready? Cooked spaghetti. <sighs> now try it in your shoulders. Raw spaghetti. Cooked spaghetti. Whew. Try it in your toes. Raw spaghetti. Cooked spaghetti. Hmm. Try it in your face. Raw spaghetti. Cooked spaghetti. <sighs> I like the shoulders. I'm going to do that one more time. Raw spaghetti. Cook spaghetti. <sighs> wow, these are strategies you can do anytime you might be nervous for a presentation or you might be really, really tired after recess and you need to release some energy or you need to calm down after recess and you need to release some energy. These are great ways to get you refocused. All right, I think it's time to make our own constellation art. Let's go for it. Now for the fun stuff, my constellation art. For this activity, you can use black construction paper and a white crayon or colored pencil. If you don't have those things, that's okay. Just use what you have. A pencil and a piece of paper works just fine. As we do this activity, we are going to practice our sequence words. First, next, then, and last. So we can practice giving directions orally. That means verbally, with our mouths, with our voices. So the first step is, first, draw about 10 dots. First, draw about 10 dots. You can also practice your sequence words by listening to the directions. So I can draw my dots wherever I want. This is cool. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think I'm gonna do, uh, let's spice it up. Let's put 11, cool. All right, next, connect the dots. Next, connect the dots. Okay, hmm, let's see. I'm gonna, I might do them in a different order than I drew them in. So I might go like this. I think I'm gonna start over here. I'm gonna go this way. Okay, 
Then think of a picture that your dots make. Hmm. What do my dots make? Do you see a picture that my dots make? What if I see kind of the head of a bird pecking in the ground. Do you see that too? This is the legs and the body, and this is the head of the bird pecking in the ground. Okay. Last, you get to name your constellation. Last, name your constellation. Hmm. Maybe since it's pecking in the ground, I'll name this constellation Woodpecker. Woodpecker. Awesome. So those are the steps that you can listen to or follow to make your own constellation art. First, draw about 10 dots. Next, connect the dots however you want. Then think of a picture that your dots made. Last, name your constellation. See if you can follow those directions in order. Or for more of a challenge, you could say them out loud like I did and give directions verbally. Once you're done with that, you can write your story on the back. With our story, we would use the same sequence words. So I'm thinking of a story about a woodpecker and how it came to be like that up in the sky. It's kind of pecking down towards the earth. So I might say first, there was a young woodpecker. First, there was a young woodpecker. Next, the woodpecker was hungry. Then, the woodpecker saw, let's make it so it saw some worms on earth, <laughs> some worms on earth, last, the woodpecker Woodpecker got a worm. That is my story about my constellation. I use sequence words to put my story in order. When you're older, after kindergarten and first grade, you will learn some exciting transition words other than just first, next, then, last. But for now, in kindergarten and first grade, these are great words to use when you're telling a story so that you can keep all the events in order. Let's read it one more time. First, there was a young woodpecker. Next, the woodpecker was hungry. Then, the woodpecker saw some worms on earth. Last, the woodpecker got a worm. The end. Try to write your own four sentence story about your constellation using the words first, next, then, and last. I can't wait to see what you write. Can't wait to see what you come up with. What a fun lesson about constellations. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. Bye.
Mrs. Teague, and I'm going to do a math minute with you. Our topic is number recognition and counting. Let's get started. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's review. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's continue. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Great job with number recognition and counting. What's going on today? Well, today I was working on a project and it's not going the way I want it to. Ah, uh, that happens sometimes with projects, Molly. Tell me about it. Well, at the library, they're having a contest about who can draw a picture that they turn into a bookmark and I've been working and working on a beautiful picture and none of them are coming out the way I want them to. I have an idea about what I want the picture to look like and it just won't come out that way. Molly, it sounds like you're feeling frustrated. I am so frustrated. Yes, I am frustrated. Oh, Molly, where in your body do you feel frustrated? I feel frustrated in my hands and in my shoulders and in my belly and my face is kind of tight and ugh, tense. I feel frustrated everywhere. Oh no, Molly, that's a problem, huh? It sounds like an uncomfortable feeling. Yes! Molly, do you know other kids feel frustrated too sometimes? Well, I guess I can see that other kids might feel frustrated. And Molly, adults feel frustrated too when we can't get things to work out the way that we want. Really? Yeah, Molly. Well, hmm, what do you do about it? Well, Molly, we've talked a lot about breathing, right? So I do take deep breaths when I'm feeling frustrated, but also if I can get outside and go for a walk, or sometimes I like to put my sneakers on and go for a short run, all of those things help me feel better. Also, drinking a glass of water. I don't know why that calms me down, but a glass of water always calms me down a little bit too. Hmm, well, I could try one of those things. You could try one of those things, Molly. And I think it's pretty cool that even though your project isn't turning out the way that you want, you still keep trying. Yeah, sometimes I wanted to give up, but I do keep trying. Molly, I wonder if there are any kids who want to share with us what makes them feel frustrated. Sometimes I'm frustrated with grandma's if no, I can't get can't push the icy and cake. Oh, frustrated. Oh, that's frustrated. Yeah. Hmm. Grown ups, it's normal to feel frustrated for our kids and for us, especially right now when things seem to be really difficult. It might be helpful for you to help the children in your lives 
to come up with a short list of strategies that make them feel calm when they're frustrated. Hey, I like that idea. Maybe you could help me make a list for me. Sure, Molly, I'll help you make a list. Remember, feel your feelings. Hey Colorado kids, welcome back for another session with me. I'm Miss Adrian. My teaching assistant Esmeralda is over here taking a break on the chair. I am very excited today. We are continuing with our space week. On Tuesday, we learned about the solar system and made a scale model of it. Today, we are going to learn about satellites. Say that word with me, satellite. A satellite here is my drawing. Satellite is an object that people send into space to orbit around a planet. Remember, we learned that word orbit on Tuesday. Orbit, say it with me, orbit means to move in a circle around something, right? So if this balloon is the sun and this is the earth, Okay, the Earth orbits around the sun. Orbit, okay? Just like that, a satellite, say this, this is the satellite, the satellite can orbit around the Earth, or it can orbit around another planet, okay? So we've got our two words for today, orbit, and satellite. Uh, we are also going to need some words because we have a project to do today about satellites. And in order to do this project, we need some words called prepositions. Prepositions describe where one object is related to another object, right? So, you've probably heard these words before, a lot of them. One is on, say that with me, on. Okay, so I could say the cup is on the whiteboard, right? On, whoop, there goes that whiteboard. The cup is on the whiteboard. Okay, we could say around, right? So I just said the satellite orbits around the planet. Around. Good. All right, we've got two prepositions. On, around. All right, we are going to need in. Okay, in, and something is inside something else, right? The marker is in the cup. The markers are in the cup. Okay, so we've got in, around, on. These are two we will need a lot today to talk about satellites. We've got to and from. If you've ever had a birthday or sent an email, Right, I can send a message to someone. The message was from me, right? I sent a balloon to my friend. She got a balloon from Miss Adrian. To and from. Satellites are used to send information, pictures and numbers to and from the earth and scientists, 
and cell phone towers, right? Information to and from. Okay, I have a little book for us to learn more about satellites. And then in a little bit, we have some guest speakers coming who are experts in satellites. Are you ready? Okay, this is a book called Satellites by Miss Adrian. Here's a picture of a real satellite floating above Earth, orbiting around Earth. A satellite is an object that people send into space to orbit around a planet. The purpose of a satellite is to send and receive information to and from Earth. Did you hear some prepositions on that page? I heard a few. Let's go back and see. A satellite is an object that people send into or in space to orbit around a planet. Ah, the purpose of a satellite is to send and receive information to and from Earth. There are some yellow words on this page that might be new vocabulary. Orbit, we learned that one. We know what that means. Send and receive is like sending a message and getting one back. I sent a letter and I received another letter. I sent a present to my friend and I received a thank you card. Okay, so satellites send information to Earth and receive information from Earth. Send and receive. Satellites are used for many things. They can send us pictures of planets. They can send and receive cell phone and television signals. They are even used to make GPS work so we can find our way around. I use my GPS on my phone all the time. If I didn't have a map on my phone, I would be lost my entire life. So let's look back at this page again. Are there any words, new words you recognize? They can send us pictures of planets. Do you remember those pictures of planets we saw on Tuesday? Those were from a satellite. They can send and receive cell phone and television signals. Oh, so even when we watch TV and talk on the phone, that is from a satellite. Scientists use satellites to learn about other planets and to study things about Earth, such as the weather, pollution, and natural disasters, like hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis. A satellite floating above the Earth can send us pictures and information and let us know when bad weather is coming. Satellites are pretty cool. All right. So, learners, we have a very special opportunity right here. We get to interview a person who knows a lot about satellites. I am not a satellite expert, <laughs> but we have with us here Amanda Abram from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and she has some really cool satellite models to help us learn more so that we can then go on and make our own models of satellites. Um, so, hi, Amanda. Welcome to the hi. show. Thank you. Do you okay. want to tell us first a little bit what you do at the museum, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am what's called an educator performer here at the museum. So I'll teach programs at the museum. I'll teach programs out at schools, although that's a little different now. So I teach programs virtually to kids. <laughs> um, so I basically get paid to play all day, and it's not bad. <laughs> Sounds like a fun job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. And I... I I'm guessing a lot of our learners have been to the museum, maybe. So they've maybe seen some of these things in person. Who knows? Yeah, it's entirely possible. I know this, uh, this Mars rover was on display for a little while, but we have shut down space because we're redoing it now. Um, so we had to remove this one so it didn't get damaged. Oh, got it. Well, cool. Well, 
let's see. We, in our episode today, are learning all about satellites and what they do and how they work. Could you teach us a little bit about what satellites are used for? What is their purpose? Sure. Um, so basically, a satellite is an object that goes around another object. Um, so if we think about it in like a more general term, uh, the Earth is a satellite because it goes around the sun. The moon is a satellite because it goes around us. So anything that goes around another object is a satellite. Now, typically, the ones that we're referring to when we say satellites are those uh, things that we send from here on Earth up into space to do a specific purpose. Um, most of those are up there for what we call utilitarian purposes. So uh, they are like serving us in some way. Uh, some of those satellites are up there to study the atmosphere, uh, TV signals, uh, communications, so making phone calls, um, all come from satellites. So things that we do every single day that we don't really think about um, actually happen with the assistance of satellites. Hmm. Yeah. So, prob so probably a lot of the kids watching this show maybe didn't even know that their phone, their tablet, the oh. map that their parents use on the phone is thanks to a satellite. Exactly, thanks satellites, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, we have those satellites that, that give us TV or cell phone signals or GPS um, directions, but we also have satellites out in space that are sent up there for a specific purpose of studying the composition of planets, so what makes up their atmospheres, um, studying just deep space, things that are out in space, comets, asteroids, uh, all sending information back to uh, Earth, telling us about what's up there, because we obviously can't send a person to Jupiter, can't send a person to Pluto right now, it would take forever. It takes us nine years to get to Pluto, so putting a human on a on a space shuttle out to, put to Pluto is just not ideal. So we send satellites um, and probes instead to help us understand what's out there when we can't as humans go there. Oh, cool. I think on Tuesday we actually learned how many miles between the sun and Pluto and it was like two billion, way too far for a human to go see. <laughs> exactly. <for ourselves. laughs> I couldn't even say the number off the top of my head. So yeah, I get it. <laughs> it's, it's way out there. Um, so as far as parts of a satellite, um, a lot of satellites share a lot of things in common. So two systems is your power system, right? We can't just take a really long extension cord and plug our satellite in here on Earth and then send it up to space. Nobody has a, a, an extension cord that long or a power cord that long. So we have to think about other ways to power those. And a lot of them are powered by solar panels. Um, so this is the Mars rover. So like I said, this is not a satellite, uh, but it shares a lot of the common uh, things that satellites have. So these panels right here, these are all solar panels. Um, those take the energy from the sun and convert it to energy that our satellites uh, can use. Because we have scientific instruments on these things. If you look here, this is actually a camera. Whoa. Yeah, so this is a camera up here. There's also two more little cameras down here. You can't really see them because they're pointing down at the ground. Um, let me see if I can move that further. But we have to have ways to power those things, right? Yeah. And, and the Energizer Bunny is not gonna do it, right? So they use renewable energy to power the satellites? Yes, and solar power is, uh, a big thing here on Earth right now, right? So some of the same stuff we use up in space to power our satellites, we're figuring out uh, and it's becoming more common to use down here as well. So these scientific instruments need to be powered too. So that's where the power systems uh, come in place. So you have power systems, you have communication systems. I'm gonna shift because there is a antenna. Sorry, I've got a cord in the way. Can you see this little antenna right here? Yeah, we can. It's called the high gains uh, antenna. And this antenna actually sends communications up to the Mars, uh, I'm blanking, the MRO. What? 
Oh, back there. <laughs> so it sends informa information back to the Mars Reconnaissance, Reconnaissance Orbiter, and that orbiter is what sends the information back to Earth. So when the rover gets the information, that antenna right there sends that information up to the MRO, or the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter, and then the orbiter is the satellite that actually sends it back to us. Oh. So On, go for it. So this, this contraption sends the signal, and the rover receives it, and then sends it to Earth? Yeah, so this contraption back there sends the information up to the, the orbiter that's going around Mars, and that orbiter is what's sending it back to Earth. Oh, wow. Like a so big our game of telephone. Exactly, the longest game of telephone ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have communication systems on satellites, you have power systems on satellites, and then many of them have scientific instruments as well. I already pointed out the camera here, uh, the camera down there. Down here, I'm going to close it. E even more, this guy right here, this is a drill. Whoa. So <laughs> Why does a satellite need a drill? So this, this is a rover, um, but I was giving you a for some scientific instruments that might be on it, but that rover uh, was sent to Mars to get samples of Earth and soil, and then send, it analyzes that information, sends it to the <laughs> MRO, and then that sends it back to Earth. Oh, got it. Right? Cool. Can you tell us about some of the other models that you have? Yeah, so turn this a little bit and angle it down. So this one that you see right here, this is the Hubble telescope. So the Hubble is what goes around Earth, but it takes a lot of really great pictures of deep space. So uh, some satellites are up there to study, like I said, study compositions of planets and atmospheres, or to study deep space, like take pictures of nebulas, which are, a nebula is like a little baby star nursery. Oh. So so I know, they're all wearing little diapers up there, <laughs> ready to be big stars. <laughs> so when we see really cool pictures of like galaxies and stars, like on the internet, that's all from a satellite? It's not, yep, all of those come from satellites, or some of them from satellites, for sure. Others are artistic, um, like scientific illustrations, so we'll get data back from satellites sometimes. And then a scientific illustrator, so a professional artist uses that data to draw a picture of what we think it might look like. Cool. Cool, when you think about it, you can be a professional scientific artist. Man, that's a job I'd like to have. Yeah, exactly, right? And then this little guy, I'll try and slide you a little more this way. So Cassini right here. You may, Cassini may sound familiar to you. Uh, this is the one that was sent to Saturn, uh, and it studied the composition of Saturn and its atmosphere for a long time, and then we don't bring these guys back. Uh, they're just kind of up there. So we actually took Cassini and crashed it into Saturn's atmosphere. Why? Day. Uh, we can't bring them back, and we don't want it to, you know, damage something else, so we crash it into the atmosphere. So when you're when the satellite is too old to use anymore, crash it, done with it. Yeah, sometimes this guy, um, as it went through the atmosphere, sending data back, so we got even a, a better understanding for what Saturn's atmosphere was like until it <laughs> pooped out on us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. The other thing, so on Cassini, it had a little hitchhiker. This little hitchhiker's name is Huygens. And Huygens, Huygens was a probe that actually released from Saturn uh, and went to Saturn's moon Titan to study its composition. And it sent a bunch of pictures of what the surface of Titan looked like. Um, and that's how we know a lot about Saturn's moon Titan, because it's a really interesting moon for us. Uh, it's a lot, it's very similar to Earth in a lot of ways, so we're really interested in studying that. So thanks to, thanks to uh, Huygens and satellites and probes, we learn a lot about things where people can't go. Oh, cool. 
Well, Amanda, I know we're, we're just about out of time. Is there any last nugget of information you think we should know about satellites before we go to build our own models? No, um, yeah, satellites can do a lot of cool things and they're really important uh, in the study of space because they go where people can't. So when you guys are building your own satellites, think about what really interests you guys out in space. Um, or maybe it is, it's even something down here on Earth. What do you want to make better here on Earth that can be solved with a satellite? Or is there something way out there in space that you're like, dude, I want to send it to a black hole. I want to know more about black holes. So design your satellite to go to a black hole. Figure out what you're going to need and how you're going to get there. I love that. We could build customized satellites. Yeah. What, a great, what a great thought to end on. Amanda, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I think our learners are really excited to go learn more and build some models and maybe someday become satellite engineers. I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. We'll see you another day. Thanks, Amanda. Sounds good. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much, Amanda and Franklin. I really learned a lot. Did you guys? Now that we know all about satellites, let's make our own. Right here, I have a diagram. So a diagram is a drawing or a picture that teaches us about the parts of something or how it works. So a diagram of a satellite. Let's study it for just a minute before we build our own model. Okay, so the pieces that a satellite has to have are a power source so that could be a battery a solar panel some way for the satellite to get energy so that it can run okay so power source it will need a communication device that's what it will use to send and receive information from Earth, right? It can send photos and receive photos. It can send cell phone signals or receive them. It needs a communication device. Okay, a container. That is basically just the part where they keep all the cool gadgets and pieces together in one space, a container an orientation finder that's a big word orientation means finding your way around so this is a device that the satellite needs to know is it facing the right way is it orbiting correctly is it facing the planet right so it can take pictures of the right place orientation finder and finally Satellites have lots of different science instruments, right? Because satellites can be used for different reasons. So different satellites have different gadgets and gizmos and parts on them. Okay, so those are the five main parts of a satellite that we will need when we go to build our scale model of a satellite. Here we go. Okay. You can see here I have gathered my materials to make my scale model of a satellite. I'm going to use a box to be the container where they keep all the important parts inside. I decided to use renewable energy, so I'm using tin foil as solar panels. For the orientation finder, the way the satellite knows which way it's facing, I'm using an old marker cap. Okay, for the scientific instruments, I'm using a piece of a sponge. And for the communication device, the way it sends and receives information, I'm using a plastic cup. To hold everything together, I'm using scotch tape. You can use other materials that you have at home if you don't have these. Lots of different materials will work. Just make sure you have all the pieces a satellite needs to function. Okay. So to connect my container with the communication device, we're going to need those prepositions. So don't forget, we've got in, around, on, to, from, and into. I'm going to poke a toothpick into the cup 
and then I'm going to poke it into the box to make it hold together. So now the communication device is on the container. Okay, now I'm going to take two more toothpicks and I'm going to tape, put tape on the toothpicks to connect them to the solar panels. Those are the energy source for the satellite. Now I'm going to use tape to connect the solar panels to the container. I'm taping them on top of the container. All right, so now I have my container, my power source, my communication device. What's missing? Oh yeah, we need scientific instruments. So now I'm going to take my sponge. And the scientific instruments, remember, can be different depending on is it a telephone satellite that sends cellular signals? Is it a scientific satellite that studies other planets? Right? It might need different types of instruments to accomplish its job. Okay, I've got my scientific instruments. The only thing missing is the orientation finder. That's the way the satellite knows which way to face to make sure it's getting photos and information in the right direction. I'm going to use tape to attach my orientation finder to the front of the satellite to make sure it's able to figure out where to face. Alright, I taped the marker cap onto the container in front of it. I stuck my toothpick into the cup and into the box. And now look at that. I have my very own model, scale model satellite, ready to fly into space and collect some information to send it back to Earth. All right, learners, that's all for today. Don't forget to check the lesson materials for instructions on how to make your own scale model satellite. You can also learn more about satellites at the NASA website, N-A-S-A. -A. And it is time because you have completed your fourth lesson with me. First, second, third, fourth lesson with me. And that means we are getting closer to solving the riddle. What has 10 letters and starts with gas? We have A-U-T. Today's letter, drum roll please is dun, 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 dun. Oh, we have A U T O. Ooh, only 6 letters left to go to solve the riddle. I hope you will tune in again next week for some more fun with me. Thanks Colorado learners. See you next week. Hi boys and girls, this is Math Minute with Miss Melissa. Today we're gonna to be talking about greater than, less than, or equal to. And this is a math concept comparing different numbers to each other. One way that I like to remember is I like to actually draw teeth 
on my symbols and I know that the teeth mean that it eats the bigger number. So this first problem, we have five and 10. We're trying to think about our symbols. We're trying to think about our greater than, less than, or equal to symbols. And so I know that 10 is a bigger number than five. So I'm going to say that 10 gets eaten by that alligator. So this number sentence here would read, five is less than 10. I could also read it backwards, 10 is greater than five. So I'm gonna think about the second one here, and I'm gonna think about 10 and 15. And I know that if I'm 10 years old and I have a 15 year old brother, he is older than I am, he's bigger than I am. So again, we have 10 is less than 15, and that alligator is eating the bigger number of 15. And on this bottom one, I have 15 and 15. And in this case, we're going to say that 15 is equal to 15. Let's just do one more. So in this one, I have 25 and 20. I know that 25 is a bigger number than 20 because in the ones place, I have a five, and in the ones place, I have a zero. My tens place are the same, so I know 25 is bigger. In this case, the alligator is gonna eat the 25. So 25 is greater than 20. Okay, let's put those in some number sentences using words. We'll start with that last problem that we have. And I'm gonna fill this in to say 25 is greater than 20. I hope it makes it easier to think about an alligator eating the bigger number. Thanks. for my abuela's birthday and all of a sudden I just spilled water all over it. Oh Juan, that sounds really frustrating. It is really frustrante. My body is tight and tense and my face is all scrunched up and I just want to scream. Wow Juan, that's definitely frustrating. Kids, can you show us your frustrated faces? Wow, Juan, looks like you're not alone. There are a lot of other kids out there who felt frustrated before. Is it because they spilled paint? Well, I don't know, Juan. Different people get frustrated about different things. Kids, what makes you frustrated? I get frustrated when I can't do my schoolwork. See, Juan? You're not alone. A lot of other kids have felt frustrated before. Frustration is just a normal part of life that we all have to deal with. And it's how we deal with it that's important. Well, what do you mean? I mean, for example, you could have just taken this piece of paper, ripped it up, and thrown it everywhere. Do you think that would have been a thumbs up solution or a thumbs down solution? I think that would have been thumbs down because then I wouldn't have anything to give my abuela for her birthday and she would probably be sad. Wow, Juan, I totally agree. And I'm so glad you thought about how other people might feel. That's really important. Mm, I have an idea. What if I took deep breaths? Would that be a thumbs up or a thumbs down solution? I totally agree. Taking deep breaths is always a thumbs up solution. I wonder if there's anything else that you could try. When I feel frustrated, I 
say to myself, I can do this, I can calm down. Is that a thumbs up or a thumbs down solution? I think that one's a thumbs up. In fact, I think I'm going to try it. Kids, can you say it with me? I can try again. I can calm down. Nice job. Grown-ups, remember, self-talk is not just for kids. It works for us adults, too. When our children see us taking deep breaths, and using positive self-talk, they learn positive ways to deal with their frustration. And remember, feel your feelings. today? I'm doing well today. Oh, great. Hey, you know, you've been back in school for a few weeks now, and I know you're doing school online, right? You still have to be on the computer every day. Yeah, I do. I'm on the computer in the mornings until lunchtime, and then since I'm a kindergartner, I don't have to have school after lunch. Oh, well, that sounds pretty good. Well, yeah, I don't like it very much. I mean, I really miss seeing my friends in school, and I'd like to be in the same room as my teacher. She seems really friendly, but I only get to see her on screen. Well, Molly, I hope that you get to go back to school sometime soon. Yeah, me too. Molly, did you know some kids in Colorado are doing school like you, just from the computer, some kids go to school some days and then stay home on other days and use their computer. And then other kids are going to school every day. They have to wear masks, but they're going to school every day. Oh, I didn't know there were so many different ways to do school right now. Molly, being on the screen and not being in the same room as your teacher and your friends, that can be stressful. It's hard for your brain to learn when you're looking at the screen. Yeah, that's what I've been feeling. You know, actually, my mom had a really good idea. Hey, what was your mom's good idea? She makes sure that all of my coloring and art supplies are ready for me when I take breaks because she knows that when I draw and color, it helps my body and my brain to be calm. Oh, calm. Molly, that is a good feeling that we haven't talked about in a while. Remind me what calm feels like to you. Well, when I'm calm, my muscles are relaxed and my breathing is easy and slow. Like, oh yeah. And how about your belly and your shoulders? Oh yeah, my belly feels comfortable and my shoulders are relaxed. They're not all squished up by my ears. Oh yeah, Molly, feeling calm is a good feeling. It's also easier for your brain to learn when your body feels calm. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Huh, that's cool. Hey, I have a picture of myself coloring. Do you wanna see it? Yeah, Molly, let's check out that picture. Oh, Molly, you look really calm. Grown-ups in the room, go ahead and pull out the crayons or the Play-Doh, and as your child has a chance, um, invite them to do some coloring and see. Does it help them relax? Does it help them get their brain ready for learning again? Yeah, I bet it does. That's the way it works for me. I'm glad to hear that, Molly. What do we want people to remember? Feel your feelings.
Hey everybody, Miss Melissa here with third grade English language development and it is Space Week. I love learning about space. I love outer space, I love telescopes, I love everything that you can possibly imagine that has to do with the universe, the sky, everything out there. We are so lucky today because we get to learn about rockets. I love learning about rockets. I think that rockets are so interesting. They are fascinating to watch them and I can't wait for you to see what we're going to learn today. Specifically, we're going to learn what rockets are made out of, all the different parts of a rocket, what thrust is, what force is, and why we even have rockets. And boys and girls, we are fortunate enough that we get to have a conversation and learn from people at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And Miss Amanda knows so much about rockets that she has decided that she will share all of that information with us. And I am so lucky and so blessed to have the opportunity to talk to her. Can't wait for you guys to see what she has. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science also has model rockets. So Amanda and her teaching partners are going to show us all of the different parts on an actual model rocket. I can't wait. Let's go meet Amanda. Hey everybody, my name is Amanda Avram. I am an educator performer over here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I am standing in the Education's Collections Department, uh, surrounded by lots of dead animals, but also rockets. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about rockets today. We're gonna talk a little bit about what goes into designing a rocket, um, what variables rocket scientists need to think about when designing that rocket, and then I'm going to bring my education collections manager in here and she's going to talk to you guys about all these things behind me because she knows way more about those than I do. So let's talk a little bit uh, about rockets. So first of all, when a rocket scientist is design, de designing a rocket, they need to think about a really big force that wants to keep us down here on the earth. It'll take like three seconds. What force do you think that might be? If you are thinking gravity, you are thinking correct. Gravity is that force that wants to keep us down here uh, on Earth. It's constantly pulling us down. And it wants to do the same thing to rockets. It wants to pull that rocket that we want to go up there, wants to pull it back down here, all right? So rocket scientists, when, de are de when they're designing a rocket, really need to think about how they can best escape that force of gravity. And there's a couple of different parts on the rocket that help it do that. So first things first is thrust. And all thrust is, is the force that gets something moving up. So a long time ago, there was this guy named Isaac Newton and he came up with three laws of motion. The third law of motion is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So what I want you guys to try and do is I want you to stand up. I want you to put your arms down at your side and pretend you are a rocket. And all I want you guys to do is jump. I want you guys to jump ahead again. This time, jump a little bit higher. And this time, jump as high as you can. What did you guys need to do to get your body up off the ground? Yeah, if you're thinking you had to push your toes and your legs down on the ground to get your body to go up, that's exactly right. All right, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So when I push down on something, like when my feet push down on the ground, it got the rest of my body to go up. So when we think about that in terms of rockets, thrust comes from its fuel. So when you think about a rocket launch, if you've ever seen a rocket launch, and if you haven't, definitely look one up. They're super cool to watch. When you think about a rocket launch, you get the countdown, you get 10, nine, eight, seven, six and you start to see that smoke coming out from the bottom of the rocket and then it gets to one and you see all that fire that fuel pushing down on the ground is propelling that rocket up into the air and it gets it going really 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 fast but once we're up into the air we want to be able to maintain that speed so that we can get that rocket out of our atmosphere and into space but there's another force acting on that rocket all right, and that force is friction, all right? So Newton's first law of motion says an object in motion tends to stay in motion until acted on by another force. 
all right? And that other force we're talking about is friction. All right, so if you guys take your hands and you put them together and you rub them, all right? You rub those hands together, your hands start to get warmer, right? That's friction. Think about uh, if you were on a, or if you roll a ball across the floor, that ball doesn't go forever, right? Something is slowing that ball, that ball down. Something is making that ball stop. And that is friction. When we're talking about rockets though, we use the term drag. Drag is slowing that rocket down. And all that drag comes from air, all right? Our atmosphere, there's air molecules, right? And those air molecules are rubbing against the body of the rocket, trying to slow that rocket down. So if you actually look behind me, you see a nose cone. That nose cone's job is to push air away from the body of the rocket to reduce that drag, to keep that rocket going up in the air at that speed so that we can get it up out of our atmosphere. And the last part we're gonna talk about are the fins, all right? The fins aren't just on there to look cool. They provide stability in flight. So if you think about a balloon, if you blow up a balloon and you let that balloon go, does it fly in a straight path or does it go all over until it runs out of air? Yeah, it kind of goes all over the place, right? So by putting fins on our rockets, it helps them fly in a more stable path. We want that rocket to go from point A to point B in the fastest possible way. We don't want it going this way and then that way and then up and then down and then over this way and over there. We just want it to go straight up into space. So our fins on our rocket are what provide stability for that. All right, now once we get that rocket up into the atmosphere, the thrust comes from its exhaust. There's no air in space, right? So it's hard to keep to, to direct things. So we use thrust in space. Going back to that third law of motion, all right? If we want that rocket to go in a certain direction, we use thrust to push out to get the rocket to go this way. Again, keep in mind this. If I wanna go up in the air, I gotta push down, okay? So whatever direction I wanna go, if I'm a rocket and I wanna go this way, my thrust or my exhaust is gonna push out this way, propelling this way. All right, if I wanna go up, my thrust is gonna push down to push me up. All right, so you see all these super cool things behind me. These are all models of rockets that NASA has used. Um, so, and then we've got this private partnership with SpaceX, which is doing some really cool things. So I'm actually gonna bring our education collections manager in here. Her name's Evelyn Bush. She knows way more about these cool objects behind me than I do. So I'm gonna invite her onto the screen and I'm gonna jump off. Guys, see you later. Awesome, thanks Amanda. Yeah. So I have models of some of the ULA, the United Launch Alliance, um, which is both kind of a partnership between Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Um, and so I have a bunch of their rockets, but I'm gonna start with the one that we all grew up with, me um, and your teachers grew up with, um, which is the space shuttle. This is what, was the rocket that was uh, being launched when I was a kid, when I was your age. Um, and my parents and I used to have a, a house on the Space Coast in Florida. We used to actually be able to see those shuttle launches. Um, they're super cool, but they're retired. They retired back in 20, yeah, 2014, I think, was the last one. Um, this is the only, up until SpaceX now, the only reusable uh, vehicle. Uh, space vehicle that we have. Um, the shuttle, the orbiter, looks like an airplane. And you'll notice it has wings like an airplane and tail like an airplane. Um, this is because it would glide back to Earth. It was not, it powered with uh, main engines during launch, but when it came back after being up in orbit around the Earth, it would fly back and land on a runway, just like a modern airplane. Uh, the rest of it, um, you have the external tank and the solid rocket boosters. The external tank would burn up in the atmosphere, crash into the ocean on launch. And the solid rocket boosters would float by parachute back down to the ocean where they would be collected by ships um, and reused again and again. Um, propellant was a solid fuel as opposed to a liquid fuel. So let's move into what we use today, which is the ULA rockets. Uh, I don't have any, the other company that's uh, active right now is SpaceX. And I do not have any models of their rockets at this point in time. 
What Amanda said about fins is absolutely true, but you'll see here that none of these rockets have fins on them. So what's up with that? Technology has gotten to the point um, where we don't really need fins on rockets. Um, I'm gonna, I have this, I just ran over and got this like drumstick um, from another place in, uh, in my room here. And I'm gonna balance it on my finger. I want you to watch what my hand does. So in order to balance this drumstick, I can keep it upright, but I have to move my hand around a lot to do it. This is what modern rocket engines do. It's called gimbaling. And the nozzle actually moves underneath the rocket to keep the rocket going and pointed in the right direction. So we don't have fins on our rockets anymore. The Delta IV Heavy, this is the biggest rocket we have that is in service right now. Um, there is no rocket bigger in the world than this rocket here. Um, this is for deep space missions that we use, sending stuff to Jupiter, to Saturn, or even beyond and out to Pluto. It's this guy that we use to launch those. Um, I haven't told them yet what, what we use rockets for. So what do we, would you mind explaining really Absolutely. quickly what, what they're used so for? Rockets are used to put satellites or probes uh, into orbit. So when you make a telephone call, that, that signal that goes from your cell phone goes to a tower, but often will go up to a satellite and move a crop be beamed across the country with that satellite. We use it to get pictures of the weather. So like hurricane season's coming up. We have uh, satellites all across uh, North America and around the equator that are looking down at the oceans and the uh, continents. And we can see storm systems moving around. We use them to spy on other countries, uh, uh, military satellites. So satellites are used for a whole variety of, of uh, applications. But we also use them to study the universe. Um, we send telescopes to orbit, we send satellites and probes to other planets. Um, and rockets are the tools we use to get those there. We even use rockets to get people back and forth to the International Space Station. Um, right now SpaceX just flew their first manned mission. Uh, so we use rockets for all sorts of things. We have a handful of rockets here. They're all kind of similar, but you'll notice most of them are divided about halfway up or so. And this is the second stage. So the primary, the primary, uh, part, the primary, the primary stage, the first part of the rocket is what's really used to get the, uh, the rocket up into uh, orbit, up into a, at a speed that is going to stay in orbit. So you have to get up out of the atmosphere and into a place that is not going to fall back to Earth. As Amanda was saying, Earth wants to pull us back to it. So we have to achieve a speed that is faster than gravity. So essentially, when I was in high school, um, my teacher put it this way, you have to throw a rock at the Earth and miss. Um, that's essentially what orbit is. So once we get up there, we have to go fast enough that as we fall, we don't actually hit Earth. And for that, we have a second stage. And I have a model of one here. Oh, mind the bear. <laughs> uh, we have, this is a Centaur upper stage. And you can see it in, oh, I can't see it in this one. So this is a Centaur upper stage and that is the upper stage of a Titan II rocket. And you can see in the bottom of that, this upper stage is in the lower part. So this is your payload bay. This is where your satellite would be, your probe would be. Um, this is the nose code Amanda would talk, talk about. This falls away. And once this all falls away, these engines fire. And that is your second stage of your rocket. And that is what gets you going fast enough to stay going around the Earth. And the payload is what you're trying to deliver. Up, the payload, up, yes, right? is exactly that. What you're trying to deliver, your satellite, your probe, um, yes, your astronaut is your... Do they still land? Do we still, like, are they able to be reused? Just how So space, they... right now SpaceX has developed a reusable rocket that goes all the way from the fairing, which is the nose cone section, um, to the main body of the rocket, and they are actively launching those and uh, landing them back again on land uh, and reusing them. The, all the ones that I have up here with me today, those rockets are either they splash down in the ocean and are never recovered, or there are still rocket bodies orbiting Earth. So some of these second stage wow. loads that are up there 
they are still just hanging out up there and they just orbit the earth and eventually they fall and falling back through the atmosphere um, they burn up and sometimes they hit every now and again you hear of uh, of a rocket body or a satellite that comes back through and that actually manages to get to the ground but usually they do burn up hey boys and girls so we have a piece of writing that we're going to try to dissect. What we're going to do is we're going to start by reading the vocabulary so that we know which words we have to pay special attention to. Usually the vocabulary are words that we aren't very familiar with, especially with things like science, like today when we were learning about rockets. Science has a lot of specific vocabulary that is only used in that area. So for example, our vocabulary words for this particular passage Force, which is a push or a pull. Pressure, which is force pushing down on an area or surface and it pushes in all directions. Body tube, this is the basic frame of a rocket. The fin is the vertical part of the tail. Lift is a force that pushes objects upward. And the nose cone is the front end of a rocket. Now in normal speech, if I were just having a conversation with you, I'm not going to be talking about a nose cone. I'm not going to be talking about the body tube or thin or lift or even usually pressure or force. So these words are very specific to what we are learning in science, specifically with rockets. So I'll pay special attention to those as I'm reading through this passage. And then there's a question at the end. And one tip that I like to give to my students is to read the question first. And that gives you kind of a purpose for why you're reading. Usually I'll read through the passage once just for understanding. Then I'll read the question, go back through and look for the answer to that question before I answer it. So I'm going to pretend like we've already read this once through just for understanding and I'm going to read you the question and we'll, I'll show you what it looks like to look for that answer. So the question that I have is what causes a rocket to take off? So in other words, what causes that rocket to go from being stationary on the launch pad to up in the air and then out into outer space? What causes that? What is the reason why it is able to take off? And I'm going to read with you this passage. Rocketry is a fun and easy way to bring many science and math principles into the classroom. These simple classroom rockets make it easy to bring rocketry principles to your homes. Rockets are used to send people and items into space. You will create straw rockets to model the physics of a rocket launch, and that's what we're doing with Porter and Chase today. Rockets follow Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so I'm thinking in my head, this is what Amanda talked to us about today. This is what they were talking about when we, when we got to have that really special time with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. The simplest explanation of physics and rocketry is that gas, pressure, power is released from the rocket in one direction. Okay, so I'm going to underline that because I feel like that is part of the reason why that rocket is able to take off. What I underlined is gas, pressure, power is released from the rocket in one direction, which causes the rocket or object to be forced in the opposite direction. Okay, I'm going to underline that also because I feel like that's important too. So that's that equal and opposite reaction. In our puff rockets, the gas would be the air that comes out of our breath. In the real rockets and the ones that we saw the models of from the Denver Nature, from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, those ones have an explosion, right? Those ones have the pressure and the power and all of that build up from the explosion that causes the rocket to have an equal and opposite reaction that makes it shoot up into the sky. To create a force, which is a push or a pull on the rocket, we will use the air in our bodies to create a pushing force. And this is what we were talking about just a second ago. This in turn will create a lot of pressure. Pressure is the amount of force over an area. Did you hear our vocabulary words as we went? So usually in a text like this, you hear the definition of those words in the text. So for example, pressure was a vocabulary word, and then it gave us a context clue. The text actually told us what pressure is, and it said pressure is the amount of force over an area. The more air you force through the straw, the more pressure there is on the inside, so the more force there is pushing out of the straw. 
When enough pressure is created in the straw, the rocket will be forced to move off of the straw. So this asks the question, what causes the rocket to take off? So what I'm going to write is I'm going to write, first of all, my question stem. And every good answer has a question stem. You can't start with the word because, and you can't just start mid-sentence and say pressure. You can't start mid-sentence and say a force. You have to have a question stem. What are you answering? So I'm going to take part of my question and use it in my answer. So it says, what causes a rocket to take off? I'm going to say a rocket takes off because, do you see how I kind of twisted those words? So a rocket takes off because. And I, I reread what I underlined. That helps me to keep track of the answer that I had found in the text. So I'm going to reread and it says that gas pressure power is released from the rocket in one direction. And then later on I kept hearing the word pressure, so I'm just going to use the word pressure. A rocket takes off because pressure is released from one direction of the rocket. So it is forced, and remember that was another one of our vocabulary words, force. It is forced in the opposite direction. And that way I've kind of also tied in Newton's third law of motion. So good writers always reread what they've written to make sure that their brain or their hand didn't make some kind of simple mistake because all too often our hand gets writing faster than our brains can go or vice versa and we make simple little mistakes often. So I'm going to make sure that my answer makes sense. So I said a rocket takes off because pressure is released from one direction of the rocket so it is forced in the opposite direction. I feel good about this. I know that I found my answer in the text also so I know that I have answered this question completely and correctly with a question sum so I know that my teacher, whoever that may be, Miss Melissa or someone else, would be happy with my answer. So boys and girls, I hope that this helps you to answer a text dependent question, which is what we did here. If you can find the answer in the text, it is a text dependent question. And always a good idea to underline the answers as you go so that you have that to reference to. Always a good idea to have a question stem, AKA part of the question in your answer. Kiddos, my sons Porter and Chase absolutely love doing experiments like most kids love to do experiments. And to be honest with you, the messier, the better. At least for them, not so much for me. Today, they really wanted to demonstrate how to make a baking soda and vinegar rocket. So let's go check that out. They are in the front yard waiting for me and can't even wait to have this rocket go off. This is my son Porter and my son Chase and they're going to do a baking soda and vinegar rocket in a water bottle. So basically we're going to have apple cider vinegar in here and baking soda. You can use any type of vinegar if you don't have this kind. But basically it should blow up when we put it on the ground. It should blow pressure into the cap and it should blow. And then Porter a little lower. Okay, you're going to have to tell me when I'm there. Okay, stop. Porter, put in as much of that as you can. Okay, ready with the lead, Chase? Yep. What do we need more? Why didn't you put more? Woo! Come on. So Porter and Chase realize that not everybody has baking soda and vinegar on hand and not everybody's parents are going to say, please go make a rocket that will explode and get baking soda and vinegar all over you in my front yard. So they have also created some puff rockets out of straws and pieces of paper and they're going to show you how they did that and they're also going to show you how to launch them using nothing but the breath in your mouth and a straw. Let's go check out Porter and Chase's Puff Rockets. Okay, Porter and Chase again, and this time they're going to show you how to build a puff rocket and how to actually launch that puff rocket. So boys, what did you do to make your puff rockets? So basically you only need one piece of paper to make four 
you cut a uh, strip of paper and then you roll it around a straw pencil. Then um, what you do is you Hold pinch on. the Order, what do you, Why do you roll it around a straw of paper? So you roll it around a straw of paper so you could fit the straw inside this little hole. So and that's how you're going to launch, launch it, it, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to pinch either side like this. To create and, the nose of yep, the rocket. to create the nose. And then you tape around it. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make your tail of your rocket, which you're going to cut out triangles of your paper and fold those the triangles into half real quick and then unfold, put them onto a piece of, and put it onto this. So Chase has three triangles on the tail of his rocket, forming, forming those three pieces of tail, but then Porter only has two on his, so we're going to see if one goes further than the other. Okay? Okay, boys. So then how do you launch these? So you put the straw into the tail and you shoot it up. Okay. Without and it far, okay. Far down. Launch this way. Let's see how far we can get these to go. Okay, and so Chase's went a little bit further than Porter's did. Boys want to grab them and do it, a, do it again. See if maybe you need a little more force behind it. If you blow a little bit harder, if maybe it'll go a little bit further, or, or if you want to blow a little softer, or angle your straw a certain way and see if it goes. I have to aim it a little to the left. Yeah, and that's all about that's that's what science is all about, right? Making adjustments and and fixing the things that you need to because if really if they wanted to they could stop here and they could fix the tail they could fix the okay. nose they could fix anything they wanted to and make adjustments as they needed to okay and ready you guys could like put so much tails on here that he could go further than this one. right could add weight oh. and i noticed that um, maybe the angle of how you shoot them matters too porter's right. sh shooting straight ahead and chase is angling up a little and uh, the only reason why these aren't going super far is because of the tail. It's a little crooked on mine, and so is Porter. So you would make some adjustments? You would mm -hmm. recommend some adjustments? That one went pretty far. So did Porter's. I hope you guys enjoy making your own if you want to. So I'd recommend more wings. And if you guys more can, tails. if mm -hmm. you guys can beat us, maybe, maybe you add some suggestions. Maybe send send in their suggestions for how to make theirs go farther to help you guys out with how to make yours go farther. Mm -hmm. Okay. See if you can beat us. Wow, boys and girls. That was such a fun day. I had so much fun learning about rockets and doing all of those fun experiments with you. I can't wait to have another day with you. Can't wait to see what we're going to learn next. Join me next time on more Colorado Classroom. See you soon.